When was the last time you hung out with some fellow believers and afterwards you just felt so much closer to God? I mean, you opened up, you shared your life, you laughed together, maybe even you cried, you paused and prayed about something. And as you were going home, you thought to yourself, why can't I have more times like that? Well, it's called Authentic Community. And today, we're gonna learn how to get more of it. Stay with me. Welcome to this edition of Living on the Edge with Chip Ingram. Living on the Edge is an international discipleship ministry featuring the Bible teaching of Chip Ingram. I'm Dave Drewy. And in just a minute, Chip picks up where he left off last time in his series, True Spirituality, Becoming a Romans 12 Christian, with a look at what it means to be part of an authentic Christian community. Now, if you want to learn how to genuinely connect with a handful of fellow believers, this message is for you. So let's join Chip for part two of his message, How to Experience Authentic Community, from Romans chapter 12. Authentic community doesn't happen when you do a little nice thing or a little nice thing here and it doesn't really cost you very much. Authentic community happens when the real you shows up. Notice it says devotion. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Humility. Giving preference to one another in honor. Real needs getting met always involves devotion on our part and humility. The word devotion here is strong. He's saying... You need to be committed to one another and lay your lives down for one another like you would for blood relatives. I mean, for people that you feel this moral responsibility for. And he says, be devoted to one another. How? In brotherly love. Philadelphia. That's the word. We named a, a city in Pennsylvania by that. It's this commitment of family love, of being there for one another, of doing whatever it takes. I thought I knew what it meant to kind of be devoted and Love. I was a new Christian, and after probably, I guess it was about five or six years, I'd been coaching for a couple years after school, and Teresa and I were married, and we had two small kids at this time, and so, I mean, I was shocked, literally shocked, that uh, God called me into vocational ministry. I thought, I just can't imagine ever him being able to use someone like me. You know, I'm a teacher. I'm a basketball coach. I can't imagine being a pastor, but uh, he made it clear, so we Went to school, and after about a year there, built some relationships. We stayed in a little uh, apartment complex. Actually, it was a huge apartment complex, but it was had uh, like these apartment here, apartment here, apartment here, apartment here. They were little quad things. And so you really got to know the people. You shared one hallway. And I came home after school. Uh, it was in my first or second year, and Teresa's eyes were all red. I said, honey, man, what is going on? Are you okay? She goes, oh, I spent all afternoon with Pat, you know, right across the hall. I said, well, what's going on? She goes, well... Uh, her husband left her. I said, oh, you got to be kidding. And uh, the shit, they'd gotten really close. They had a little boy the same age as my little boys. They were all about five years old. And she goes, it's, it's worse than that. The bank accounts are emptied. He left her. They have a like two or three week old newborn and she has no money. And we just prayed and cried. I thought, wow. So, you know, I'm thinking... My heart's really going out to her, so I'm thinking it's really spiritual. So, honey, you want to pray for her? She goes, well, actually, we did that. But I've been thinking about it, and we talked over dinner. She goes, I think we should, in two days, her rent is due, and they're going to kick her out if she doesn't have rent money. And I think we should pay for her rent. And my portfolio at this point is very easy to keep. I can keep it in my head. <laughs> we don't have a savings account because there was no need. We had a checking account, and I made under $1,000 a month on straight commission as I went to school full-time. So I said, honey, if we pay for Pat's rent, our rent is due in 10 days, and the moment we pay for her rent, we will have $10 in our checking account. She said, I know. Oh, <laughs> you know, when you marry above yourself, it's really not very good at times, you know? <laughs> and so I, it was like... You know what? Okay. But you, you know what it was? It was being devoted isn't like, oh, I hope it goes well for her. I heard she had cancer. You know, that family's going through a rough time. Blah, 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 blah. No, no. It's like we're in this together. She's family. And so, you know, I'm figuring I'm probably going to have to learn how to be a pastor someday. Might as well start now. And so, okay, Lord, here it is. And we write the check. And by the way, it was not noble. I think people get this idea that when we take big steps for God, yes, God. Most of my really big steps are like, yes, God. You know, <laughs> I don't really want to do this. I'm pretty. 
And, but okay, I'm going to claim your promise, but my God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. You said it would do that. And the context is giving, being generous. Philippians 4.19, I'm standing on that passage. Our rent's due. No money. We have a three-day grace period. First day, grace period, no money. Second day, grace period, no money. Third day, hey, yo, <laughs> you know, uh, which part of this verse am I misinterpreting? Or, you know, what's the deal? And that day in the mail, that day, uh, an envelope came, you know, business side envelope. And in the left-hand corner, it had a, a football helmet that was green and yellow. And it was from Lombardi Avenue. I got a letter from someone from the Green Bay Packers. I was like, are you, you know, what is this? So I opened the letter and uh, the letter says, hi, Chip, I'm sure you don't know me. I met you about six years ago or so. Uh, I was a senior in high school at the time and you taught a Bible study in San Jose. And I later went on and played college football and I was the first quarterback taken in the draft. And um, I'm playing for the Green Bay Packers now. And when you taught that Bible study, all I can tell you, I can't really remember what you said, but something happened that changed the spiritual trajectory of my life. And I've never forgotten it. And I've not thought of you for six years, but this is weird. Out of the blue, you came to my mind and I'm supposed to send you this thousand dollars. I mean, it was just like, oh, you know what, you know what happened? I got to experience authentic community. This is how God works. This is normal. He puts people in your life that you have some more time than they have. You have money that they don't have. You have energy that they don't have. You have spiritual gifts that would help them that they don't have. And you don't nod and think, well, I went to church. I read the Bible. I went on a mission trip. You think I'm a part of this community. And that need is a red light going off on my soul to love them. And I will tell you what, man, we got tight with Pat. I mean, it was like 20 years later, he got a postcard. Teresa, you know, I saw somewhere, you and Chip, and da, da, da. I just want, and you know, a picture of her and her grown son and the little one. And you know, our hearts were connected to Pat. Why? Because wherever your treasure is, your heart follows it. And then I got to see that God also, that was the first of many lessons. I mean, that was, I mean, that was a like, ooh. And after that, in the last 30 years, we've done that scores of times. Scores of times, never knowing for sure how God supply. My testimony, he always does. And what we've experienced is God. See, at the end of the day, you know what most Christians don't know? God is real. He's not a philosophy. He's not a formula. He's not a moral code. Jesus is a person and he's real and he loves you and he made promises and he wants you to stand on him and you take risks, which are called faith, and you love one another and people get love through you and then he supplies. When the real you meets real needs through devotion and also through humility. Because at the end of the day, you know what? You have to think more of other people than yourself. Jot in the corner of your notes, Philippians chapter 2, if you will, verse 3 and 4. The apostle Paul says, I mean, think of how all-encompassing this. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourself. Boy, would that change your small group? Would that change your family? Each of you should look not only for your own interest, but also the interests of others. In fact, he goes on to say, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, that although he existed in the form of God, he didn't regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself, taking the form of a bond servant, becoming obedient even unto death. Humility. Humility is putting other people, giving preference where you lift them up. I've had the privilege of working with someone that's modeled this for me. And there's a number of people that do it, but I just have the longest history with a guy named Greg. He came out of the Silicon Valley, early days of Palm Pilot, later went to Cisco, project manager. Uh, later was a volunteer over in Santa Cruz and had 40 or 50 volunteers, did light, sound, real super techie guy. When I went to walk through the Bible, he came with me and uh, was just, he's a, just a manager of just tremendous ability. 
And then as Living on the Edge went out on its own, he ran all of Living on the Edge, the broadcasting, the money, the finances, the operation, everything. And we started to grow, and there was a guy that came along. He wrote a strategic plan for us, and he led a huge ministry in the United States. And I'll never forget, he met with me. He said, this is really exciting, and I think God's in it. I'd like to help you fulfill it. And a little humility, I said, well, I now know kind of what you've done in your life, and you now know all of our books. I could pay you maybe half of what you've ever made. This is a, an amazing downward mobility opportunity for you. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, I'll take it. And Andrew came, and in the next three and a half years, he tripled the size of everything that happened at Living on the Edge. But here was the interesting point. Greg is really good into the people and roles and personnel and HR and all that stuff. I'm not. And uh, we sat down, the entire executive team of Living on the Edge, me and Greg. There's two of us, you know. And uh, he said, if we hire Andrew, you need to know something. I said, what's that? In about six months, he needs to lead the whole organization. And I need to be just over broadcasting and just technology. Because his gifts and what he'll bring, he's far better. He will bring what I don't have. And there's no way the ministry will be what God wants it to be unless he has that role. So I'm just telling you that, you know, he needs to become my boss. Now, when's the last time you ever worked or met anyone who had the power to hire someone that when he hired them, he knew they will become greater, I will become lesser, he will have a higher role, make a higher income, and I will move down because I want to serve you, serve God, and the mission is what matters. You know what that's called? Giving preference. See, when you walk into a small group or when you walk into church or when you are in your family and sit around at the table, which I hope you do, all of us either have one or two sets of lenses on. One lens is who asked me a question? Who cares about me? Why didn't anyone give me a hug? How come everyone seems so happy and no one cared about me? I went to the small group and no one seemed to really listen, but I was telling my story. <laughs> and I'm lonely and I need a friend. And what about and what about? And that's one set of glasses. And other people go with a set of glasses that say, I've got needs and God knows what they are, but I wonder who he wants me to be a conduit of grace in this small group. Or when I get home from work, I'm absolutely tired. I don't want to talk about all that stuff I went through, but I bet my wife or my husband or some of my kids, they're going to need someone that's alive and caring. And I want to engage and find out how can I put them above myself? How do I give them preference? And here's the weird part. Those people who do that experience amazing joy and people flock around them. Because Jesus said, give, and it'll be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, back into your lap. For in the same measure that you give. And it may include money, but he wasn't talking about money. In the same measure that you give, it'll be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running back. See, that spiritual ceiling where we get stuck is often the real you doesn't show up. And if the real you doesn't show up, often we're not meeting real needs. We're just meeting convenient or superficial needs. But then he says, not only does the real you and me need to show up and meet real needs, but he says, you need to do it for the right reason, not to please people. He says, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Not lagging behind in diligence. Literally, the word is slothfulness. The, the literal meaning of it is not being slow. Fervent in spirit is a picture of water coming to a boil. It has this idea of, you know, like when the bubbles come up right just before the, you know, when it's, when it's boiling. This, this, this energy, this passion, this focus, fervent in spirit. Not obligation, duty, I guess I got to do this, got to go to go to this group, and so-and-so has a need. I, what do you think? I guess we ought to help them, blah, blah, blah. That's not the picture. And notice the focus isn't, what will I get, or will people think better of me? I'm not going to be slow about the promptings that God gives me. I'm going to be filled with enthusiasm that comes from God, and I'm going to do it not even just for them, but to serve him. How many of you have ever been like talking with a close friend or been in a small group, especially a Bible study, and someone in the Bible study said, hey, would you all pray for me? I'm lazy and I need help with my laziness. Can I see those hands? See, most people, especially Americans, none of us think we're lazy. 
But part of it is we have a, a warped view of what laziness is. We think laziness are people who watch seven hours of TV, play four hours of video games, and eat chocolate bonbons on the couch for days on end. They're lazy. Biblical definition of laziness is not doing what needs to be done when it needs to be done. A lot of, we mask our laziness with good things. God speaks to your heart and he says, you need to apologize to so-and-so. And so you think, oh, wow, I think I'll go read a chapter in the Bible or pray. Guess what? It's not God's will to pray or read a chapter in the Bible when he says, go apologize to so-and-so. See, laziness is refusing to do what needs to be done when it needs to be done. And we have all kind of denial and avoidance. And he says, in your motives... Don't be slothful. Be enthusiastic. Notice at the bottom of your notes, genuine service to God is characterized by diligence, excellence in what we do and how we do it, and enthusiasm, passion to serve God and love people, not please people or impress people. My dad was a, an alcoholic, a great guy in general, but just one of the roles in an alcoholic family is making peace and fixing things. Well, once I came to Christ, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize it, it took me a while to get going spiritually, and when I finally got going, what I found out was I was still trying to fix things and work out my dysfunctional issues now in the body of Christ. And what I found is this group of people who call themselves Christians, and I was genuinely transformed, and lots of great things were happening. But I found if you memorized a lot of verses, and you served people, and if you said the right things, and you just kind of went off the charts in your performance orientation to, quote, what looked like loving people, you got a lot of strokes and affirmation. And so after a slow start, I went nuts. I memorized hundreds of verses. I was in this Bible study, led this Bible study, was in this group, did this. I mean, I was just like a maniac. I was such a maniac that there was times I thought, I make myself sick. <laughs> and I had this opportunity, you know, if you were a leader on this campus, you could go to this special thing in the summer that only a few people could go to. And you memorize these verses and everyone would go to this city and you'd get a job and then there'd be, you know, like a uh, hundred or 200 and you'd be on teams of five. You would have a team leader and four people and, you know, they would help you grow and you got a job and you did evangelism. It was, it was like a, a hot house for spiritual growth. And it was really, really beneficial. But this particular group um, had a very structured approach to sanctification or how you grow spiritually. And their approach combined with my warped personality and background was like the perfect storm to create a Pharisee. And so I, I really thought by the end of that summer, I mean, you need to do this, you need to do the Bible study, you need to share your faith, you need to do this. By the end of that Bible study, you go to the end and your team leader would meet with you individually and kind of give you an evaluation and say, as you go back to your campus, here's something to think about to really help you grow your campus ministry. And, you know, some of the people were talking and they were a little uptight, like, wow, this might be very threatening. I'm thinking this is going to be great because in my private world, I'm thinking I'm more disciplined than anybody here. I, if they were going to give an all-star most valuable Christian award, You know, so I'm supposed to have this meeting with John, my team leader, and I literally can't wait. I'm thinking, I'm finally going to get some pats on the back that I really deserve. And he's going to tell me just, you know, it's probably you, Hudson Taylor, Dawson Trotman, Martin Luther, you know, <laughs> you and the boys are going to make a big impact someday. You know, I mean, <laughs> it was so sick. <laughs> and uh, I, let, me, uh, let me pick up the story because it's too embarrassing to tell. John was quiet, he's my team leader, and un had a very understated approach to his leadership. I was honestly looking forward to the meeting, and I secretly hoped that he'd notice the discipline and what I modeled for the other members of my team, the servanthood that I've demonstrated in our relationships, and the knowledge and faith that were rapidly developing in my life. I'd worked hard and was ready for that good pat on the back. Our meeting didn't go as I expected. Although I was full of zeal and performed well throughout the summer, John's evaluation stunned me. His assessment of my spiritual growth was far different than my own. With very few words, he said he appreciated getting to know me throughout the summer and that God had revealed three verses on his heart that he wanted to share with me, handed me the note cards and said, I pray God really speaks to you as you go back to your campus. 
anticlimactic. So I've got these three three by five cards with verses that he had handwritten out. The first one said, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bond servant of Christ. Galatians 1.10. I thought, hmm, that's an interesting verse. Second verse, John 5.44. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? There may be a message here. All doubt was removed by the last verse, Luke 16, 15. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. But God knows your heart. That which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. See, the real you can show up and you can meet real needs. And you can do it to serve you like I did. To get affirmation, to get strokes, to play a game inside the Christian community where you appear loving. But what you really do is you end up using all the verses that you know and all the good deeds that you have to create a little world where you just send a different hologram of a fake and phony person that's working out your own dysfunctions to get people to accept you rather than say, I am accepted in Jesus. And the acid test of your motives is always when you get treated like a servant, when no one notices, when they don't say thank you, when you're not rewarded, when you feel like, you know, the only one that sees what I'm doing is God. The only one that seems to really care is God. And in your heart of hearts, if you can say, oh yeah, that's right, I'm serving an audience of one. People's response, people's strokes, people's affirmation. God, when it comes or if it doesn't come, that's not why I do what I do. It's the real you meeting real needs for the right reason. And finally, it's in the right way. Authentic community is always going to be played out in the context of pain and difficulty and challenge. In a fallen world, uh, it's really, really hard to make the time for authentic community. It's really hard to be honest when you're bombarded. And so in the right way is not in your own strength, not in what you can do, not in the power of your personality, not as Jesus is some sort of ideal model. I'm going to work hard and I can love people and I can be real and I can do this and this is how much money I have. This is no, no, no. He says your focus the right way is there's an upward focus and there's an outward focus. And it says you need to rejoice in hope. That's a mindset, not rejoice in circumstances or people's response. He says, what do you need to do? Persevere in tribulation. In other words, in the midst of when it's difficult, you refuse to give up because you're going to do life with this group of people and it's hard and everything in you wants to give up, but you refuse to. And you're going to help people make it through. And your resource is going to be devoted to prayer. You're going you're to have multiple times where I don't know how I'm going to pay my rent. I don't know how I'm going to solve this problem. I don't know how I'm going to heal this marriage. I don't know how I can break this addiction. But God, I'm asking for your help. And I'm going to share my life openly and in authenticity with a group of people that are safe. And we're going to go through this together. And there's an upward focus. It's not your resources. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in every child of God. You have all the power you'll ever need. But that power gets accessed through his word and through the community of God's people. And that power gets accessed as you pray. One of the greatest evidences of genuine humility and dependency is your prayer life. And I've been there. You know what? When your life basically is like you get up, you grab a cup of coffee, you get in the car, you run, you're going. There's a big meeting. Got to do this with your kids. Got to make a big decision. And you do all that. And you're not on your knees saying, God, I don't know what to do. God, I don't have the wisdom. God, I don't know how to do this with one of my kids. God, I need, please. When you're not doing that, what you're saying to God is, I know you created the world. I know you're all wise. I know you, every, you know everything that's happening today, tomorrow, and forever. But I really don't need that kind of help. 
I think that's the definition of arrogance, isn't it? Our prayerlessness basically says, I got this one. You just keep that world spinning. I'll handle this one. And God is opposed to the proud, gives grace to the humble. That's tapping his supernatural resources. And so there's an upward focus, and then it's followed by an outward focus. An outward focus says, notice what it says. It says, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing or pursuing hospitality. It's, it's, it's where he says, there's an outward focus. The resources are, there's times where God's going to ask you to contribute. The real meaning of contribute is contribute. Like give money away to people in need. Give time away. Give things away to someone that doesn't have what you have that's a brother or sister in Christ. Contribute to the needs of the saints, fellow believers. And, and, and when you do, it's like, well, what about me? God says, I got that one covered. And then it says, pursuing hospitality. Literally, the phrase is pursuing strangers. So you can get into authentic community. I think this is added at the very end for a very important reason. It can be us for and no more. We got the greatest Bible study. We're really close. We're so authentic. We're open. We can share anything. We're super supportive. We've been doing this for 25 years with just us. Wow. Goody for you. I wonder if there's anybody else in the church that might have needed this in the last 24 or five years. Who are the people that are unlovely? Who are the people that are lonely? Who, who are the people that need you to pursue and open your home and open your heart and invite them to a meal? Who are the people that need you to be the presence of Jesus? See, this, this is what breaks the ceiling. This is how you get unstuck. The seed of God's word in a good and honest heart, the soil, in the environment of authentic community. The real you, meaning real needs for the right reason and the right way, is where supernatural transformation occurs. It mattered so much to Jesus. Notice how he closed his last prayer recorded in scripture. He says, my prayer, Father, is not for them alone, his disciples. I pray also for those that will believe in me through their message, that's us. That all of them, notice, may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. The Trinity has authentic community. And Jesus is praying to the Father that we could experience what they experience and then we could experience with them. And then look at the purpose clause, so that. This is why this is so important. So that they may believe you sent me. The greatest apologetic on the face of the earth is when you love authentically brothers and sisters with the real you meeting real needs for the right reason, the right way. Those outside of Christ will understand and believe that Jesus could be their savior too. Chip will be right back with his application for this message, How to Experience Authentic Community, from his series, True Spirituality, Becoming a Romans 12 Christian. This six-part series sheds light on how to move your relationship with God from a performance-oriented existence to a loving, grace-filled life. In these messages, Chip describes the profile of an authentic follower of Jesus and provides practical steps for how we can get there. Now, for those who don't know, true spirituality is the core discipleship teaching here at Living on the Edge. And because of that, we have a ton of great resources to help you get plugged in with this series. Whether that's the study guides, the DVDs or CDs of Chip's teaching, the book, or our free MP3s. For a limited time, all of these helpful resources are discounted. So order your true spirituality resources today by going to livingontheedge.org. That's livingontheedge.org. App listeners tap special offers. Well, Chip, in this last year, we've been thrilled and actually shocked by the tens of thousands of people who have gone through these daily discipleships that we've been talking about for the last several programs. Do you have a special word for those that have already gone through a daily discipleship? Well, Dave, I really do. And here's the special word. Uh, we got such great feedback of those that would meet with me daily in the daily discipleship. Here's my challenge. The people that I heard from that took it to the next level, that had amazing experiences, were people that did one 
and they were just into it and said, you know what, this is something where if each one of us could get one other person to go through this, imagine what would happen if people could know God, understand his word, share his word, and experience his power. Here's what I know. Many Christians that need help, even that are struggling, are one invitation away from you to say, I'm going to do this. You send them the link. You, you show them how to do it. And let's do this together. It could change the course of their life. Let me encourage you, yes, do the daily discipleship. But let me encourage you, especially those of you who've been through it and know the value, invite someone to go along for the ride. Thanks, Chip. Well, we're so excited to share with you this new daily discipleship with Chip, True Spirituality, based in Romans chapter 12. Our heart behind this video series is to really help you dive into God's Word and discover how to more intentionally live out your faith. For 17 days, you and Chip will walk through what true spirituality looks like and how you can put these truths into practice. Now, if you're looking for the next step along your faith journey, let me encourage you to be a part of Daily Discipleship with Chip, True Spirituality. Now, you can sign up for this study right now, and when you do, we'll send you our friend Lance Witt's devotional based on Romans 12 called Leave Ordinary Behind at No Cost. Sign up now while this offer lasts by going to livingontheedge.org or by calling 888-333-6003. That's 888-333-6003 or go to livingontheedge.org. App listeners just tap Discipleship. Well, now here's Chip to share some deeper application from this message. As I was thinking about this message, you know, I thought about authentic community. And the first thing that came to my mind was some men's groups or couples groups I've been in or Actually, a guy that I'm working out with right now, he's a personal trainer, and he was a very committed Christian, but was never in authentic community. And wow, when he got into a group that shared from the heart, his life just, it's been amazing to watch. But then as I thought about it, I thought, you know where the real authentic community needs to begin? I mean, I love couples groups, men's groups, women's groups, all that's great. And we share hearts and we're going through it together. But I think the first and most important group is your family. And for some that are single, it might be a, a roommate. But for many of you, it's, it's you and your kids. It's you and your mate. And it's the real you showing up at home, meeting real needs at home and doing it for the right reason and the right way. Now, could I just implore you to do some of those things that build authentic community. I mean, real practically, eat together as often as possible and at least three or four times a week have dinner together. Talk to one another. Have a time where you put away all the devices and people actually make eye contact and talk. And if you have little ones, please, please, please don't miss the bath times and the bedtimes. You're shaping the soul of your child as you in an unhurried way tuck them in Tell them a story, read a Bible story, pray with them. Authentic community is the, the fiber that connects our hearts with one another and eventually connects it with God. Can I encourage you? Don't miss out. Thanks, Chip. Well, let me take just a second and thank the generous people who make monthly donations to support the ministry of Living on the Edge. Your faithful gifts help us inspire Christians to live like Christians. Every gift makes a huge difference. If you haven't partnered with us yet, would you prayerfully consider joining the Living on the Edge team? Make a one-time gift or set up a recurring donation by going to livingontheedge.org or by calling us at 888-333-6003. Our website again is livingontheedge.org and our phone number is 888-333-6003. And know we're blessed by whatever the Lord leads you to do. Well, until next time, this is Dave Drewy saying thanks for listening to this edition of Living on the Edge. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you'd like to watch more content like this, click and subscribe here to our channel. And by the way, if you'd like to know more about Living on the Edge, find out about more resources, maybe get on the mailing list, go to livingontheedge.org. See you next time.